this tour. All right. How many people read the newspaper? Then you know the danger you're in driving with Captain Nash. So right off the bat, let me point out over your head, those orange things are your life preservers. However, orange and blue is a gator's favorite color. So wear them at your own risk. We're going down the beautiful Wakulla River. It starts ahead of us there at the dive tower at the mouth of Wakulla Springs that is the headwater of the Wakulla River. Now Wakulla Springs puts out an average of 400,000 gallons of water per minute. That's an average. And on high water days like we got now, like back in 72, it may put out as much as 1 million gallons per minute. Big old gator laying back there to the rear. We're going to have to look for the gators in a different spot today. Due to this high water, they've decided to start climbing trees and vines. So we'll be looking up for the gators, down for the birds. Y'all hold on now. Let's get on down the river a little bit away from the heat. You'll notice we'll drop a degree or two. And the reason is, the Wakulla Springs water runs 68 to 70 degrees year round. Now the Wakulla River runs approximately 9 to 12 miles down to the Gulf of Mexico. After it hits the Gulf of Mexico, nobody knows where it's going to go. But we're going to take a little three mile circular trip we call the Circle of Life. And I'll point out a few things to you that you might not have known before. On your left, these big old trees out here, they're called a cypress tree. Now the cypress tree is a hollow tree, and inside of there is where the wood duck lives. You'll see some holes about the size of a tennis ball from time to time, and that's where the wood duck goes in and makes their nest. Flying at 25 to 35 miles an hour, the wood duck doesn't even fold his wings, just flies straight in a hole. How they stop, nobody knows. They might just bounce off and be hard-headed about it. Over here on the right, right off the bat, we got a gator floating on the log. Hold on just a second. I say, whoa, whoa, mule. Now we got some big swanee cooter turtles over here to the right, too. Those turtles are called the swanee cooter, but that big old lizard is called the alligator. One of the only constant things here at Wakulla Springs, cold water, fish, and the alligators. Our butterflies and birds change with the seasons. But that old boy, that's what he does. He gets something to eat, then he lays up and takes a nap. Kind of like my teenage son. So they got a lot in common, you can tell. That's just a little guy. So he hadn't had but just a little lunch. Later on, he'll probably catch another fish, maybe a bird, and take another nap. This old Wakulla Springs, Wakulla River, has been a site of many photography actions. So if y'all get ready to have a nice picture, just holler at old Captain Nash. I'll pull right up there to where you can get them the whites of their eyes. See, a lot of people shot movies here at Wakulla Springs. Discovery channels, National Geographic, public broadcast systems from all over the world, as well as Hollywood, have shot several major motion pictures here. Indians say Wakulla meant strange lands and mysterious waters. Well, I believe them, because as we round this curve, you're looking directly down into the Amazon River. Yep, that's what they called it in the creature from the Black Lagoon. If you watch the movie, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of scenes of the Wakala River. I'd like to direct your attention to the right now, though. There's a little black bird sitting there with a candy corn looking beak. That's called the moorhen. And by the time we finish this trip, you're going to agree that the moorhen is just about as human as you can get for a wild critter. You see, they raise their babies exactly the way people raise their babies, right on down to the table manners. So as we go along, we're going to learn more and more about the moorhen. Right now, I'll let you know that they used to be called the common galadoo, but the people that changed birds' names changed them to the moorhen. I guess if they ever become extinct or endangered, we'll call them the less hen, but for now, they're still the moors. Up in these trees, you see this gray stuff hanging out. That's called Spanish moss. It's an air plant. It doesn't harm the tree in any way, but it does make some excellent soup. If you've never had Spanish moss soup, you are really missing something. Let me give you the recipe, ladies, so you can cook your husband some Spanish moss soup. You see, you take two pounds of Spanish moss, a tablespoonful of salt, and a dash of pepper, and boil it for an hour. Then you add in two old nasty stinking tennis shoes and boil it for another hour. Throw the Spanish moss away and eat the tennis shoes. That's Spanish moss soup, y'all. Hang on, I'll turn on our 
25 air conditioner. That's in seven front windows at 25 miles an hour. Now here on the left, we got some little juveniles learning to eat, learning to swim. Let's get a little closer. Y'all get y'all a nice picture of some teenage moorhens. You see, the old moorhen's a communal bird. You'll find out a lot more and more. But these guys were the first hatchings of the year. Now they're up to teenage. Hadn't quite got grown yet. But let me tell you what's so different about the moorhen. You see, they'll set two or three nests a year. The old mama moorhen will get them up to teenage years. She'll hatch out some more babies, and she'll let the teenagers raise them while she's hatching more. How many times have you ever said, watch the baby, I'm gonna run to store for a minute? Well, that's just the way the moorhens do. And I guess that's why they call them moorhens, cause there's more and more and more every time you look around. Up there in the tree, I see some people pointing. Kinda hard to see from back here, but it could be our river osprey. The osprey, commonly called a fish hawk, lives in that big old nest up there, and it's possible that's what you're looking at. But I'll wait till I get past and look out the back of the boat where I can see, and let you know if that's what it was. Well, I didn't see him, so we're gonna have to see him on the return trip. Here we go on down. Look, and there's another big scene of the Amazon. The old Johnny Weissmuller shot quite a few movies here. You might remember him, old Tarzan. A lot of footage, a lot of file footage made on the old Tarzan right here at Wakulla Springs. Now let me just see if my little surprise is still sitting here. If it's not, we'll have to look elsewhere. But yes, it is. Here's my baby alligators right here on the log. These little guys right here, about seven to eight inches long, have just hatched out. There's three little babies here and their older brother sitting right up on the log keeping an eye. Now don't worry about snapping your picture fast Yes. because we're going to come back and forth two or three times. Y'all are shooting with the best today so you may as well get the best shot. That's what old Pat Benatar said. You might remember her. She said, hit me with your best shot. So y'all going to get it today, boys. The best shoot, best spot to shoot is right here behind old Captain Nash right out the back door. So if you got a picture you really want, just ease back this way. Now that's Larry, Moe, and Curly, the little ones, and Gertrude is the big one sitting up there. A mother alligator is going to hatch out about 60 to 80 of these eggs each year, but only 10% of them survive, and that's due to predators. Predators could be a bobcat, an osprey, a cottonmouth water moccasin, or it could be a human being. But one of the worst predators to the baby alligator is the male alligator. He'll eat every single one he gets without a second thought. So it's up to the mother alligator to defend him, and defend him she will. A mother alligator is the best fighter since Muhammad Ali. We might even get to see a gator fight here on the river today, cause Wakulla Springs is a wild and natural park. Right there on the right, is our ways where we pull the boats out of the water and do all the repairs and do everything necessary. Oh, look at there. Big old gator sitting up there. We're gonna back up and look at this one. See, that's where they go when the water gets high. Because up there is a different food source. When the water's low, they have to go for fish and ducks and summer ducks. You see, here at Wakulla Springs, we have summer ducks. Summer ducks and summer not. And I'll be before those old magnolia trees, a couple hundred years sitting there. Back during the time of the Paleo Indian, 10 to 12,000 years ago, that field was a site of a manhood ritual. You see, 10 of the Paleo Indian braves would get on this side, 10 would get on that side, and they played a kind of a game. Now the Indian maidens would stand to the side and whenever their side did well, they would scream the war chant. Well, they had a little thing similar to a football, but it was more like a soccer ball that they would throw back and forth. Well, one day one of them got the idea to run up the middle. They tackled him, and as time evolved, they became two of the greatest football teams in the nation, the University of Florida Gators and the Florida State Seminoles. Right there, folks.
Now you might want to take that with a little grain of salt because that could just be a piece of river folklore. I'm not sure. Let's turn that 725 AC on to see what's going on here. Woo! Feels good. Right out here on the right, I want you to look at some of our flora. That old trees I've named are flora. If you look, that old cypress tree has been told to me well over 800 years old. It's completely hollow, but it's still putting out vegetation for the more hens to get limbs to build nests, for the herons to sit in, and for the little critters to climb on. That thing's been through untold amounts of hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning strikes, and is even filled with honeybees from time to time. But you can see, it's still a healthy old tree. The cypress, one of the hardest to kill, and the only predator it has is a human being with a chainsaw. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, got now. Yeah, kick that can, but I'll see if there's some gas in that thing. I think we're... Oh, no, we done run out of gas, y'all. I need a volunteer to swim back up river, please, and get us a can. Of... Captain never leaves the ship. Okay, no volunteers. I guess I'll have to pull into the shell station on the left here and refill. Right there on that log, you see the Swanee Cooter. The old Swanee Cooter gets up there on that log for a couple reasons. Number one, they just like to sit around and talk like old men in a barber shop. Number two, it dries the algae off their back, makes it a little easier to swim. Number three, it raises their body temperature up to help them digest their food. And number four, that river's so cold, they just want to get out and take a break. But what I really wanted to do was give y'all a special gift here today. So if you would, everybody get real quiet and listen up real close. So that's called peace and quiet. I figured y'all hadn't had a dose of that in a while. And you'll never get that in New York City. Oh yeah, like I say, Wakala Springs is a completely wild and natural park. Now we have quite a few snakes here. We have diamondback rattlesnakes. We have little diamondback rattlesnakes. We have pygmy rattlers. We have brown water moccasins, cottonmouth water moccasins, coral snakes, and probably two or three that they just don't know about yet. But all of these snakes prefer to stay up in the swamp where the water don't run so fast and it's not quite so cold. The old mud puddles will warm up during the day and the old snakes can catch frogs and fish and all the stuff they like. Now we do have a couple of different snakes that stay down here in the river and in the trees. One is a brown water snake, another is a banded water snake. Now from time to time, they'll drop in on a boat and give us a visit. So I didn't want you to panic if that happens to happen. The water snakes aren't poisonous, but they do have a few teeth that are kind of painful if they latch on to you. Well, we haven't had one on the boat in almost two or three hours now, so I'm sure we'll be all right today. But I have to warn you ladies about something. You see, the old brown water snake prefers ladies because they wear perfume. And <laughs> perfume reminds them of a flowery tree they can hang in and catch a small bird. So if one of these snakes happens to jump in, and get in your lap, don't move. Old Captain Nash will just come pick him up and drop him back over the side. If you got earrings on or anything shiny, I'd go ahead and take that off right now because this back jungle can get a little tight. Right here on the right, hanging over the river. These trees are called wax myrtle. As we go past the limbs, look, and you'll see little berries starting to come on them. Well, the Creek Indians taught the early settlers how to take those berries and boil them up scrape the wax off of the top of the water and make candles. It was also a good insecticide. You could rub it all over your body and it'd keep mosquitoes, fleas, gnats, ticks, chiggers, all them little biting red bugs and all them swamp critters from biting you. So you see, it's a different way of life, but it works just the same. In these wax myrtles, it's the favorite nesting spot of the little green heron and the yellow crown night heron. And I had a couple of little green herons in this tree about three weeks now, so let's see if we can find them. Y'all just look real, real close. What do you see there, sir? You see a little green hair? There's a baby right up there. There's a baby. Right up, way up high now. Oh, he learned to fly. Did you see that? I've been watching those guys for about three weeks. 
Now y'all let me know if you see one of them brown water snakes in that tree because they like the wax myrtle too because of the little hens. But there's some littler ones in there. Y'all look real close up in there and I'm sure you'll see them. If you got long reddish brown blonde hair, I'd be cautious right here because typically where those snakes come. There's one, look, there's a water snake from the high water he's got up in the limbs. He's right, oh, he's poised to strike. Look out, oh my God, there he comes. Oh, the old snake strikes again, huh? You know, ma'am, when you got on the boat, I knew you'd be the next victim. <laughs> we can spot big old bullfrogs from time to time sticking their head out down here. We got some bullfrogs that stretch out over a foot long in this place. You can hear them at night singing. But you know what? I can almost smell baby alligators. I've been on this river so long. I don't know. The wind's blowing, you can't never tell. But I'm telling you, I can smell a baby alligator just as sure as my name's Captain Nash. I can smell them. I can see them somewhere. Oh, right there on the left. One of our teenage babies right there looking at you. Y'all feel free to walk on over. There ain't no rules on Captain Nash's boat except don't jump on a gator. And that's pretty self-explanatory. As I told you, only 10% survive. Well, just last week, there was five of them on that grass, y'all. Wonder what could have happened to the other four. It could have been the river and his long singing song. Now, that little guy there looks to be about six to eight months old, so he's probably one of the first hatchies here at Walcoa Springs this year. But now that you've seen the baby gators, y'all keep your eyes open. The water's kind of high, and we may see them in the vines. You see, they'll climb right on up there and wait for a bird, just like they would down here. There's one laying on the vine right there to the right. Look at this, one. And in the background, two, three. Tree climbing gators, folks. I bet you never thought you'd see that. Yep. See, we got gators on the left and gators on the right. Gators in the morning and gators at night. All over the beautiful Wakulla River. See that one sitting right there? See him laying up in the bushes? Right there. Oh, you never know what you'll see. Time to time you'll look up out there and see a white-tailed deer. One of the funniest things about the white-tailed deer is their love for poison ivy. They'll stand on their hind feet and eat poison ivy right out of the trees. It's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And that's good with me. They can eat all the poison ivy they want to because I'm allergic to it and I don't like the stuff. Now, how many people here has ever been dancing? I'm talking about dancing. How many people's never been dancing? Then y'all know how important dancing is to a culture. Well, before and after a war and all kinds of times in between, the Indians used to dance a lot. If you look to your right, that red leaf and green leaf vine hanging right there is the old ancient Indian magic dancing vine. Yep, you can rub that vine all over your body and you can dance for two weeks, 24 hours a day, nonstop. That's because that's poison ivy and I guarantee you, you'll dance for two weeks. Leaves of three, let them be. There's just some things in nature you're supposed to look at and not touch. Right here on the right is one of my pretty young female anhingas sitting on a tree. The female has a pretty mink coat neck. Look at that long beak. Let me back up, sir, get you a better shot. It's so ready. The anhinga stands in those trees to dry their wings because they have little or no oil in their feathers whatsoever. And when they swim, all sticks out of the water, just their head and neck. So when they get ready to go again, they have to stand up on the limb and dry them wings. Now the male will have a black neck, and somehow or another, a little lavender eye makeup. But that girl's been sitting in that tree for quite a while. I think she's gonna call it home. Another reason they call them a snake bird is with that long neck and that three-inch switchblade, they swim under the water and spear a fish bring it back to the surface, throw it in the air, and catch it and swallow it whole. <laughs> now if an anhinga catches a big fish that's a little too big to swallow and he's still kicking around, 
what he'll do is stand in that tree and beat that fish on the limb until it quits moving. Then he'll sling it in the air head first and swallow that fish whole. The old Ed Hinga. A lot of people know about the old gator's teeth being a weapon. A lot of people don't know that the tail is a major weapon also. Old gator lay up in that grass up there near the river, cover himself up, can it camouflage itself good? And a raccoon, or even a bigger gator, will get a deer. Slap them with that tail, drag them in the water, and have them for dinner. There's another pied bill grebe on the right. That's the funniest bird you ever seen trying to take off. They go pippity poppity pippity poppity boom across the river, and then they're gone. Let's turn that AC back on for a minute. We'll go on up here and see what else we can see. Now run along here. We've had quite a few baby alligators hatch before the high water. So I want everybody to look real close. So let's look on these vines and leaves. Yep, there's one in the vines there. We'll back up and look at him and we'll look for some more. Kind of interesting how the old mother alligator does it. They're a little different than a swamp gator. Out here on the river, they'll tunnel in up under the shore, dig them out a big dome-shaped habitat, and that's where they make their nest. You see, I told you, we got tree climbing gators here at Wakulla Springs. But inside of their big dome-shaped habitat, they'll build a big bird nest out of limbs. This is when they're getting ready to lay their eggs. Well, on top of that, they'll take some vegetation from the river, make a bed out of it on the bird nest, and then she'll lay her eggs. Then she'll cover it with more vegetation, and it forms a sort of incubator. Everybody knows when stuff starts rotting, it starts heating. Now, if the temperature is above 91 degrees in that nest, the babies will be male alligators. If it's below 82 degrees, they'll be female, and depending on the average temperature in between those two temperatures, it'll be proportional as to what the temperature and the sex turns out to be. As the alligators get ready to hatch, they start grunting inside their shell. And the old mama alligator will go to that egg, uncover it, pick it up and help that gator out in her mouth and bring her out and lay them on the grass and then go remove the rest of them. Now if she happens to pick up an egg that don't move, she simply swallows it and moves on to the next egg to help the baby out to the river. So right along here we had about 15 and a big old mama gator and I imagine she moved it back up there a little bit when the water got high, so we got to look in the trees. Hey, I guess keep a looking. We'll hey, see them gators. Yellow crown. Oh, dear. dear. Where is he at? Back we up. just spotted a yellow crown night here and here. Somewhere he's hid up there in the bushes. No, that's... He's that. right, right behind that bush, right in front of the white part. Yeah, yeah. Right here, look front. Yes, yeah. Right look front. There. Oh, there, look at there hidden. That pretty big bird there. It's called the Yellow Crown Night here. Now this year I had the honor of watching this mom, or one of these moms, hatch her babies. Back there where I showed you the old magic Indian jumping vine, there was a nest of Yellow Crown Night Herons. They were hatched out of big pink eggs, and I noticed myself that the first nine weeks, those babies stayed right in the nest. At week 12, the mother showed them how to walk limb to limb. Along about week 14 to 15, they started flying, and about week 16 flew the coop. So I guess you could say that mother there suffered from the old empty nest syndrome once again. But it'll start all over. She'll have another season. That's an immature pied bill green going back there. everything in the world out here guys if you knew how to do it you could live out here you could eat from the river drink from the river and live like them old moor hens which by the way brings me to the rest of the story you see these moor hens like i told you they're very communal birds they work together to take care of the babies but when those babies are born they're about the size of a good golf ball 
they can't fly, they can't swim, they don't go underwater, and they can't run very fast. So now what keeps an alligator from just eating every one of them? Well, I'll tell you, they're not your average little chicken. They're pretty smart birds. What they do is they'll have two adult moorhens and the babies out feeding on some grass. Well, that weed right there called the pickerel weed, when an alligator approaches, the mother lets out a distress call. Sounds kind of like, ah, ah, and the babies run with her up into the pickerel weed because they know the old gator can't maneuver very well. Well, that's not the end of the story. The other moorhen will run across that gator's face, dragging a wing and screaming like he's crippled because he knows that the gator will go for the easiest kill. Well, he'll lure that alligator completely away from them babies. And then yeah, that poor crippled yeah, bird yeah, fly up in a tree yeah. and look around and laugh at the gator. Yeah, He'll yeah. go, yup, yeah. yup, 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 yup. And that's also kind of an all clear for the mother that everything's safe. Bail. Look at this mother right here, another pine bill grieb. She's got three eggs she's sitting on. Only time I've noticed her leave her nest was to get a quick bite to eat and then back to the eggs. She's not too concerned about anything except them three little eggs she's going to hatch. Look at that gator up there in the trees. Look at him. Now, if that's not Florida at its finest, I don't know what is. And remember what I told you. For every one you see, there's a hundred we're not seeing. Now, that one's Wally. I told you we have to name all these gators every year, and it sure gets rough. You ever notice the gators always got a grin on their face? Always smiling. Of course, I guess if all you did was eat seafood and relax, you wouldn't have much to frown about, would you? There's some baby moorhens right here. Look at that. Actually, little teenagers, they're getting all up there now. Got a little fuzz on their head, so they're acting like they're the big boy on the block. When they're born, they're completely bald-headed, and they got a red little cap on their head. Now, I've heard, I had not seen myself, but I've heard that's a fuel indicator. And I've noticed the way these moorhens feed their babies, and it could be true. See, the one with the reddest spot is the one that needs to be fed next. Now, I've noticed these moorhens teaching their children proper table manners. You see, she'll be feeding one, and one will try to break in line, and she'll grab him right by the head. Now, to me, it looks like she's gonna pinch his little head off, but she knows how much pressure to put, and she don't hurt him. Now, how many of y'all ever got in trouble and run from your mama? Well, let me tell you what the more. Oh, we got a volunteer right here. This little guy's gonna be honest. <laughs> well, it's not a good idea to run from a moorhen if you're a baby moorhen, because I saw just the other day, she run after him, picking him in the behind till he stopped and took his punishment. So you see the old moorhen is a little more human than you might think. Let's turn this old air conditioner back on. We'll go up here and see some more things we might not have seen before. strange thing happened here this week during the high water. Not only did the gators climb the trees and all the birds get up in the trees with them, and I believe we got a year, there's a little baby gator laying on the right there taking a sun bath. But if y'all have noticed something, this river water's been black. Well, one of our tour guides who's here today with us on the tour, Michael Jones, noted that all of a sudden we had clear water running right here. So if you look on the right side of the boat, you'll see the water's clear. See an old swan and cooter swimming along. If you look off the left side of the boat, you'll notice it's not clear. It's that dark color. Back to the right, we've got clear water. Back to the left, we got dark water. And now you're qualified to be a tennis referee at any time you choose. But actually, what we're studying over, and it's not known to be true, but so far everybody agrees that perhaps a new spring has opened up here on the back channel. So we'll see what happens. In a moment, you're going to see this clear water go dark. So we've got a location, and we're thinking that there might be a reason for some good exploration up here. Still clear water on the right, dark water on the left. 
How many acres is this whole Wakulla Springs? The whole entire acreage of Wakulla Springs. Out of 205 cruises, sir, you're the first person to ever catch me where I have to tell you I don't know. 5,000 acres? Well, what we call it down south here is a whole bunch of land. Just a whole bunch. But when we get back to the ticket office, I'll give you a square figure. It's roughly 5,000 acres. Yeah, roughly about five. It's between 4,500 and 5,000 acres. Thank now, we still got clear water, but it's starting to turn a little bit rusty color. Still clear on the right, still dark on the left, starting to get darker on the right. So what everybody's deduced so far is right up in here is there's a creek with a new spring boiling out. Now, like I say, it's just opinion, but you saw the clear water, now you see the dark water. That could only mean one thing. Either somebody spilled a bunch of Clorox back there, or we got some fresh water running. All right, now we're to the part of the channel we call the movie channel. Like I told you, there's been a lot of film shot here. Amongst Hollywood's films, The Legend of Joe Panther. Story about a little Indian boy wanting to grow up and be an alligator wrestler. Well, his dream come true, but every dream has a price, and he paid it. Another one y'all might remember was old Tarzan. If you look straight ahead of us, you'll see that palm tree standing there in the river. That's the tree called the Sable Palm, which is the Florida State tree made famous by Johnny Weissmuller in the Tarzan films. You see old Tarzan diving out of a palm tree with his knife in his mouth to go fight a giant rubber crocodile. That's the tree he jumped out of, the old Sable Palm. If y'all have noticed off the right side of the boat now, the water's completely black in here. And your captain has just had a heart attack. <laughs> Woo. That's enough to get you going, folks. That's better than CPR. I feel better. How about y'all? Right up directly in front of us now, that little creek, right there is a famous scene from Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yep, that was a creature that wanted to kidnap a beautiful young lady played by Julia Adams, a movie star back in the 50s. You see, the creature wanted to marry that girl, so what he done? He set a trap right here for the riverboat Rita. He put logs across the river, and when that old boat jammed up, the divers went off the front to free it, the old creature snuck in the back and kidnapped his lady. Well, it didn't turn out too good for the old creature. He ended up getting the bad end of the deal, Right out in front of the dive tower, he disappeared right in front of the cavern, which is also in the movie, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Now folks, do the lightning. I'm gonna go ahead and speed this old tour up and we're gonna get on back to the dock. But I've talked about as much as I can talk. Y'all seen about as much as you can see. And I think it'd be the best idea for us to slip on back in now. What do y'all think? All right, we got full agreement here and the old back channel. This place used to be owned by a lady named Sally Ward. Old Florida cowboys used to drive their cattle north.